All right, praise God. Here we are, uh, Thursday, June, let's see, September the 10th, <clears throat> 2020. And uh, we're back at looking at <clears throat> whatever the Lord has here tonight. And um, so, um, for this time of uh, the year and for this broadcast to see what the Lord has for us, I appreciate everyone. Hi, Sister Spalling. Um, we'll just uh, kind of give an introduction here or talk a little bit, just giving people a little bit of time to get on. Um, I will give you a report on Brother John Budd. He is in the ICU at, uh, in the hospital still. Uh, today was a better day than yesterday, and, and uh, he's not worse. That's a good, that's a good thing. And, and uh, he's, um, we're still, you know, hoping for improvement. Seemed like he rested better today, and his uh, lungs are a little bit better. They are basically feeding him through a tube and giving all his medications that way because if they take him off of oxygen long enough to even eat, his oxygen level drops considerably. So so everyone keep praying for our Brother Bud, if you would. I appreciate it. He's a dear friend of mine and has been for many, many years. And uh, we, we need him in the body of Christ. And so... Uh, we're just having faith and petitioning the Lord to bring him through all of this. Um, let's see. I have some things that I, I want to address tonight. Uh, you know, um, I, I will mention um, the, uh, I'm going to mention to you 10 things. I've, I have addressed this a couple times, but I haven't actually give you any list. I mean, I've spoken some things, but anyway, I'll give you 10 things that <clears throat> uh, has to take place prior to uh, the end of the Gentile world. I think this is important. Uh, I have uh, I have an interest in saying a little bit more uh, than I've said before on, a, on iniquity. A lot of people think that iniquity is is uh, you know just working wrong and out of order, and there's more to it. There's more to it than that, and iniquity. And, and of course, I've talked on it some, but I, I have uh, uh, some more thoughts on it. I probably will maybe address either this Sunday at church, or I'll address them maybe next Thursday night. But tonight, I'm going to give you these ten things that that have to take place. Number one, <clears throat> the church. Uh, the restoration of the church has to take place, of course, uh, before the end of the Gentile world. Uh, the uh, two-horned beast in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation has to speak as a dragon. And um, it... Uh, that's, that's three, and I will say that in, in my position is that is the United States, is the two-horned beast. I know a lot of brethren won't identify who it is, but I don't see how it could be identified any different, and I don't mind elaborating on that a little bit if necessary. Number three, the two-horned beast has to make an image to the beast. First, first, I'm saying the two-horned beast is the United States, and first, it has to first speak as a dragon. It has to come to a dragon power, which is a world power, and <clears throat> and it has to join, conjoin with a, uh, a religious system to be able to be a dragon power. And be a civil power that rules the whole world. I'm still trying to determine, you know, and pray, asking God, and, uh, uh, how is that going to happen? 
I am looking at, at uh, President Trump. Uh, I do believe President Trump could be a man that could be uh, used of God. Uh, to, and I believe God has you to me. Uh, you know, the Bible says that that uh, uh, the Lord sets up kings and he tears them down. And the, the heart of a king is in the hand of the Lord. So the Lord sets up these kings. Uh, God, whoever's going to rule in any kingdom in this whole world, God's in charge of. And so, but of course, I do feel like that the two-horned beast is the United States, and so I'm trying to consider. I'm asking God, meditating on it, studying on it, because I do believe we're down in the end of uh, of a 30-year period. I think the the day of the Lord spoken of in the in the the Bible, and particularly in the United States, the four angels loosed out of the river Euphrates. Uh, uh, the last two time frames of the last two angels is a 30 year period and a 15 year period, which is the last prophetical hours, the 15 years and the 30 year period is the, the prophetical month, which I believe, uh, you know, and I'm not trying to be dogmatic on dates and I'm somewhat reluctant to give out any dates because so many have been given out in time past and been wrong. So I'm just saying this is the best that I've been able to come up to with prophetical timing. And so I believe that um, in 2003, Brother Leniger died. I, I, I'll, I may go through a little bit of dates and just show you why my position is what it is. But I'm seeing that the last prophetical hour will start in 2033. That gives us just a little over 12 years before the church is restored and the last prophetical hour starts. And I may want to talk a little bit here tonight before I'm finished. You know, there is a teaching, an old teaching in the body, that the seven trumpets of the book of Revelations are down through the thousand years. I'm going to explain why that cannot be so. That can't happen. That's that that violates the context of scriptures in the book of Revelation, and I'll explain why. But the uh, seven trumpets began on the uh, they began in the early church, Jesus Christ, and went right on through. And we're we're not in the seventh trumpet yet. We're still in the sixth trumpet. And so I, I, I'll try to elaborate on, elaborate on that a little bit and try to help people understand it. But anyway, I've gave these three so far. The church has to be restored. The United States has to speak as a dragon with them being the two-horned beast in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelations. It doesn't matter what you believe on, whether you believe the United States is the two-horned beast or not. The two-horned beast is going to have to speak as a dragon and set up or make the mark the image of the beast and so that's the third thing that the the two-horned beast needs uh, will make an image to the beast these things have not happened yet so uh, I'm telling you you've heard me state state before that Jesus isn't coming tonight he's not coming this week me and coming this year uh, the coming of the Lord number one is not a snap of the finger anyway the coming of the Lord is uh, in the end of this world it will be a 15 year period in the last prophetical hour but Jesus is manifesting himself in a greater way right now uh, and we need to be sensitive enough to God to realize what the Lord is actually doing okay then once the image of the beast is set up, then the the the, the eight the papacy becomes the eighth head of the dragon. So the the dragon power of the two horned beast is a short lived. It it only continues for a short space. The angel told John in the book of Revelation. So uh, so it will quickly transition to the eight head of the beast which will, that's the the beast that this is talking about 
is the papacy that uh, ceased to rule, but it's going to come back in the rule once the image of the beast is set up. And then another thing that will take place is the United States will fall. The United States will fall as a dragon power. It won't be completely devastated, I don't believe. I, I think, though, it will fall as a military, financial, civil, uh, and uh, a, a power, it, a dragon power. It's not going to be, rule the world anymore. In fact, it will be such a shaking to the whole world, uh, it will be a devastating uh, event that takes place that will affect the entire world where I see the, you know, if you remember the type of Elijah in the Bible when he went up on Mount Horeb and the, the uh, wind blew against the rocks and then the uh, fire and brimstone fire uh, came, uh, which th that just shows that uh, the shaking of uh, that's going to take place, the winds blowing. You know, in the seventh chapter of the book of Revelations talks about the four winds and God had an, has four angels holding back the four winds. We've always taught that is civil, military, financial, and religious powers. And God, even though those winds are blowing uh, and it's taking, holding them back because they're, those winds are are going to be devastating winds that could hurt. It could hurt the earth, the sea, and and every and any tree or child of God, the people of God. So the Lord's holding that back until He seals His His servants in their foreheads. So the United States it will fall. It will be in judgment, and all of this is going to take place if. If 2003 is a correct date, or anywhere close to being the correct date, then uh, we only have about 12 years before that's going to happen. So in that, you could look at if President Trump gets one more term, which I'm praying he does, because he, he at least holds a conservative position for the church, and it would give the church a little more time, and... Uh, then uh, eight year term after that, that would be a 12 year period, you know, eight, these next four years and plus 12 years. So something's gonna happen here pretty quick, probably within the next two presidencies or no more than, than well, I would say the next two, uh, but it could possibly be three if the next president's only held a four year term each. But uh, I, it's, it's a little bit hard for me to see where uh, where the Democratic side could could set this world up to be a dragon power. However, you know, we just got to watch the Lord and see what the Lord does. But remember what the prophet Isaiah uh, Amos said when he said, the Lord doeth nothing, but first he showeth it to his prophets. So the people of God are not going to be left in the dark. Uh, let me give you a scripture concerning that in, in uh, Thessal the book of Thessalonians. Uh, this is not a planned message tonight, so I don't have anything just already, uh, you know, scriptures in front of me for you, but I'm, I'm just talking off the top of my head right now. Uh, in the book of Thessalonians, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, and uh, this is concerning, and he's writing a Gentile church. So he's talking to the Gentiles and he's prophesying down in the end of the world. And look what he says here in the fifth chapter in the first verse. He said, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. I don't know how many of you have heard that before, but... Uh, that's uh, uh, a saying that a lot of preachers, you know, uh, they'll say Jesus is coming to the thief of night, but they don't read the rest of this. And I'm going to. Verse two says, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord 
so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now listen to the next verse. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the light nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunk, drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. So I'm just showing you, we're not children of the night. Jesus is not coming to the church as a night. He's coming and he, we, the people of God will well know what time it is and what God is doing. And they'll be well informed by the people, of, by the ministry of God. So uh, the Lord is coming uh, and, and, and it's to those who are wise virgins. Wise virgins are those that have put oil in their lamps. That's what I'm trying to give you, oil tonight. Oil is knowledge, and when it's ignited by the Spirit of God and anointed, it becomes light. It's, uh, it becomes understanding. And so you can have knowledge where you've got understanding of what God is going to do in the future. You can know what time frame we are at in God's timetable. And the people of God right now is not a time to sleep or to slumber. Right now is a time to be sensitive to God's spirit. Right now is a time uh, is uh, uh, not only just to be sensitive to the Lord, but to be sober and, uh, and be seeking God and be serious about what time we're living in. Um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more here in just a little bit, but let me let me try to finish these 10 things that I mentioned. The first one, the church has to be restored. Second one, the two-horned beast in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation, which I say is the United States of America will have to speak as a dragon. It hasn't done that yet, but it's getting very close. Number three, the two-horned beast will have to make an image to the beast. And then... Uh, it will fall, but before it falls, it will make that image to the beast and it will give power to the beast and the papacy will become the eighth head of the dragon. He has to gain that power. And then of course, number five, the United States will fall. It'll fall in judgment and it will be a shaking of this world in a of great magnitude. This earthquake in the Seventh in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelations, the eleventh chapter of the book of Revelations, and in the sixteenth chapter of the book of Revelations are all the indicative of the United States falling in judgment. And as I was going to say before, in the type of Elijah, you know, uh, the wind blew against the rocks that was on the mountain, broke the rocks, fire. The next it was fire or judgment. Then it was an, a, an earthquake. And that's the same as these earthquakes I'm mentioning. It's, the, it's this judgment and shaking of the world. And then the 10 kings has to come into power. That's the next thing that'll have to take place after, you, after the United States falls. The 10 kings will come into power and they'll give their power to the beast for one hour. Uh, and uh, right now I say that is the United Nations I can't see, uh, and by the way, 10 kings, the number 10 means judgment. I don't think that's literally 10 uh, individual kings. I think it's, it's, it's a judgment seat, which I see the United Nations being. And when America falls in power, 
I think the United Nations will try to uh, bring as much uh, stabilization to the world as it can because of the shaking that, that America falling is going to be. Uh, I don't say that uh, I don't say that America is going to be totally destroyed. I think very, very, very possible that the major military bases will be destroyed. Our finances will be uh, uh, affected. Uh, in fact, they'll be worse than affected. They'll, they'll go down. And uh, our civil power, where our civil voice will no longer be a strong voice in the world anymore. Um, I can tell you how I see that's going to be, but I'll leave that for right now for something later because I'll never get through if I get on that. Uh, well, the harvest has to take place. See, the church will be restored. All this is going to take place right at the same time that the, that the church is going to be destroyed, uh, 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 restored. If you read in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelations, uh, the second woe is passed after the earthquake, which is, the Amer is America falling in judgment. And then it immediately shows there's a, a church restored with a restored ministry with three particular messages. Uh, fear God, give him glory, number one. Number two, uh, uh, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And number three, do not take the mark of the beast or his image or you will receive the wrath of God upon you. Those three messages will be given by a restored church's ministry. The ministry of the restored church will do that and it will harvest this world. And in that harvest, Babylon, God's people, come out of her, my people, that hasn't taken place yet, but it will take place. God will empty all that he can get of his people out of Babylon and gather them into the body of Christ. And after that, Babylon will be judged. Read the entire 18th chapter of the book of Revelations and the 19th chapter, and you'll see that God is going to judge Babylon after. But first, he's going to get his people out of Babylon. So... Uh, harvest has got to take place. That's number seven. Number eight, Babylon will be judged. And, and of course, in that judgment, God will gather his people out of it and judge it. Uh, and at that time, number nine, the bride will be made up. The bride will be made complete. God will finish making up his bride and prepare them in the marriage supper of the Lamb to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. So, and then uh, number 10 is the pouring out of the seven vials. Seven vials of the seven last judgment will take place ending in the battle of Armageddon. That will end the Gentile world. Prior to that, I, I could add one more thing. I could tell you that before that takes place, uh, and even before the bride is made up, God will graft the Jews back into the body of Jesus Christ. Remember in the 11th chapter of the book of Romans, the Lord said, if, they be a, if we being a wild olive branch could be grafted in, and they're a tame olive branch, how much more uh, is it possible for them to be grafted back in? But Paul goes on and tells that won't happen until the fullness of the Gentiles come. So in the end of the Gentile world, you can watch this telltale mark. In fact, we better add that in here uh, before the seven vials, before even the bride's made up, uh, after Babylon's judged, or during that time, the, uh, the Jews will be grafted back in. God will graft them back in. And let me say something about that. Just stop and think about this. And in fact, if you look at the parable of the uh, uh, the parable of the uh, let me get my mind going here. Uh, uh, it's 
it's right on the tip of my tongue. I can't, I can't bring it to my mind. Uh, it's the, um, just a minute, I'm getting a phone call. I mean, here, sorry about that. Um, it's a parable of the, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, my mind's not working that good. Um, uh, it's talking about the great gulf that was fixed. Somebody put that parable up there for me rather quick. Somebody, somebody stick that in there uh, where there's a great gulf fixed between, uh, it's about the uh, Abraham, uh, the rich, uh, huh, I couldn't get that in my mind to save my life right now. Um, where there's a great gulf fixed between uh, Lazarus. It goes, he, Lazarus goes into the bosom of Abraham, the rich man and Lazarus. I'm sorry, finally I got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brother Fisher. Anyway, I just couldn't get my mind to go there. But what that parable is about, it's about uh, the rich man is the Jews and, and Lazarus is... is uh, uh, the Gentiles that goes into the bosom of Abraham. In other words, the Gentiles are added into the covenant uh, by Jesus Christ, and they enter the bosom. That's the, the covenant of Abraham. And uh, but see, the Gentile. I mean, the Jews were were uh, the Lord left the Jews and went to the Gentiles because they rejected Him, saved everything that could be saved, and the harvest in the end of the Jewish world. But then he turned to the Gentiles. Well, uh, but look, God has held them in a great gulf. It's, this is a great wisdom of God. God, they, they have not been uh, dissolved as a people. They're not a people. The, the Jews are still, uh, they still are Abraham's children and there's still a covenant for them. And so... Just like Paul said in the 11th chapter of Romans, that he would graft them back in, but not until the fullness of the Gentiles come. Is it Hosea that says, or is that Amos, that said that after two days, talking about, see, two days, they would, uh, 2,000 years is what that talked about, 2,000 year days, that God would actually graft them back in. And so, and here's a wisdom. The church would fall away after the Gentile world if God didn't graft the Jew back in because there's not anybody else that God could, could pass this torch of this message and this work to that would keep it from falling away. Everyone else would be uh, without knowledge, without the ability to hold this in a second heaven condition. But the Jews, when God grafts them back in, God's been keeping them in the law of Moses and the prophets and holding them in that place. And they will, when they come back in this, when God begins to touch their minds, it'll be like when God touched the apostle Paul. When Paul was absolutely against the body of Christ, he was against Christ. Being the Messiah, he fought against it. He put people in jail over it. He saw people killed over it. But when God touched him on the road to Damascus and blinded his eyes, showing him how blind he was, not recognizing the Lord Jesus Christ and the Messiah that God sent to this world. Uh, but when he saw it, it all of the scriptures of the Old Testament and the law and the prophets exploded in his mind and he saw it and he said, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, he said, uh, you know, and he said, I count all that dumb that I might win Christ, that I might uh, know him in the power of his resurrection and his suffering." Uh, he, it, all of that exploded in Paul's mind when, when God touches the Jews and grabs them back in the, all that God's held them in of the old covenant that's going to explode in their minds and they'll get this message way faster than 
the Gentiles were ever able to get, get it. God's held them right there in that gulf. We couldn't reach them and they couldn't reach us. But right in the end, God is going to bring them together with us. And it's the same thing as Elijah's mantle touching Elisha when he came down off of Mount Horeb. And when the, the young man, Elisha, was touched by the mantle of Elijah, and that's this, this ministry of a restored church, when this mantle touches them, uh, just like that young man dropped those, he was plying with 12 yoke of oxen, he left that, he dropped that and ran after Elijah and said, I have to follow you. He said, what have I done to you? He said, I have to follow you. Let me go kiss my mom and daddy goodbye. That, that's saying I'm leaving Judaism. I'm counting that dumb that I might win Christ. He went and burnt the harnessing of those yoke, yoke of oxen and uh, killed the oxen, gave it to the poor and went and told his mom and daddy goodbye and followed Elijah up until the time Elijah was caught up on the other side of Jordan, which is a picture of the bride being made up. And it's, it's the same thing, God grafting them in. They'll have this message and this mantle. You remember what happened when, they, when, his, when his mantle fell to the earth and Elisha picked it up and walked over to Jordan and slapped the waters and said, where is the Lord God of Elisha? Elijah. And the waters rolled back on a heap, showing that they had the message, the power, and the calling of God to continue in a restored church and follow the footsteps of this restored ministry. So God, in his wisdom, has held them right where they are, and he will continue with a Jewish ministry to start out the bride of Jesus Christ ruling and reigning with Christ in judgment over a thousand years through a Jewish ministry. Now, many other many others have come in. But what I was telling you was, watch. Watch for Jews, full-blood Jews to come into the body of Christ. And as they do that, you're going to see when they start coming in, you can know that the time is getting short. Just like the Gentiles. There were some Gentiles in the end of the Jewish world harvest that, were able to make the bride. But for the most part, Gentiles weren't able. They, they didn't have enough oil in their lamps. Uh, they weren't foolish virgins necessarily. Foolish virgins are people that are fools that are slumbering and sleeping and uh, they're not sensitive enough to the things of God. And they, they, they're, they are virgins, but they won't make the bride. They probably will. Many of them come up in the resurrection of new earth, possibly, but uh, uh, that is the resurrection of the unjust. Some of them may come up then, but what I'm saying is, is that uh, the Jews down here, they won't have time to make the bride. Most of them won't. Uh, there will some make it, but there'll be many Jews come in right during this time and the last prophetical hour, and it'll be pretty close probably to the judgment of the seven vials uh, with all of that happening. And so there will be a Jewish ministry here that will carry this on down through the thousand years and the church never will fall away again. And so after the Jews are added in and the bride's made up and then the seven vials are poured out. And so, and now I might say something about myself, uh, my position on how uh, the timetable that we are in. We're in a time frame that, number one, I'm going to say a little bit about this coronavirus thing. I'm, uh, I'm really talking to God about this, and I'm really praying and meditating on it because there's been many things happen in the United States uh, since the United States came into existence. And in the last... Uh, 100 and almost, almost, we're getting very close to 120 years, but 150, 17 years, this body come into existence and this body has never, ever, God's never shut this body down from having meetings. We have not had a meeting in a year. Uh, 
uh, it's been, uh, you know, the Lord's just, just he, sh he shut the world down. Uh, you better believe that God is the one that is in control. There ain't nothing happening that God's not in control of. Uh, there are things that take place naturally. Take things. There's things even take place by chance, and God doesn't hinder it. God doesn't hinder God's plan. But what's taking place today, you can be certain that God is in charge. God's in charge of it. He's well aware of it. Nothing's going to carry or catch God unawares of anything. And he is in control of every nation. He's in control of this world. He's in control of everything. And God, uh, you know, the Lord's doing something in the world and he's doing something in the body of Christ. And I will prophesy and say to you that the world will never be the same after this, this pandemic and what is taking place right now in politics all over the world. Um, the world will never be the same and the body of Christ will never be the same. There's many people that's going to become very complacent about going to church because they're having to miss so much church, and they'll become complacent and less sensitive to God over it. And this thing will, it will uh, make a separation from who is really, who really has a, has a vision of death and can stay in the body of Christ. This is somewhat of a shaking, and it may not be over. God may do some things more devastating that's going to drive some of his people back into the church and some of the world. See, there's a lot of ungodly sinners in the world. When I say ungodly sinners, you see a totally ungodly person is a person that doesn't know God and doesn't have, have hasn't had any... Uh, knowledge or relationship with God. But a, a child of God, there's many a people that's been touched by God. There's many a people that's had the grace of God through uh, a measure of salvation, through repentance, and God's touched their lives. And But many of them starved to death spiritually. They didn't have enough spiritual food to maintain. But there's also victims. There's this work of God has been a, a very detailed and entailed work that has affected so many people, and many people have were victims of it. There's men of God that didn't have enough wisdom to save people. I'm one of them. I, when I was a young man of God, I didn't have the wisdom. I, there, there's people that got hurt under my ministry. I'm I'm sorry for that. I know they're God's children and I know he knows how to reach out and, and save them. Uh, but there's many ministers. In fact, I'd venture to say there's very few ministers that weren't uh, lacking of wisdom and didn't know exactly how to handle the people of God. If you remember the red horse stage, uh, sin entered in. That's a Pentecostal type era. And that red horse stage the rider of the horse had, had a sword in his hand and he had power to hurt men. So you take the word of God, but in a red horse stage, without too much wisdom, you can hurt people with the word of God. Uh, you can handle it wrong. You can be too rough or you can also be too tender. You know, to have God's wisdom and know just how to handle people and to have that gift to handle people is... is uh, it, it, number one, it's a gift of God that God gives us, but to learn how to be proficient in, in that gift. And so there's many of God's people, what I'm saying is it's out in the world that God is going to have to gather them up. Most of them won't come back in until the harvest of the last 15 years of prophetical world, uh, a, a Gentile world. Uh, the Lord will have enough power manifestation of the power of God and his spirit that's going to reach out and touch people enough that's going to draw them. Jesus said, my, no man cometh unto me except my father draw. The drawing power of God it was going to come become way far more powerful than it has ever been. Anyway, uh, so uh, I... Uh, 
uh, <clears throat> you know, I know that God's going to save save many of those people, and and uh, that they're, they're going to have to be dealt with. So, uh, in this last, I, I am saying the last uh, the thirty year period started in two thousand and three. I'm saying that's when God began to heal this body and bring all the remnants, all the separations and divisions of the body back together. God did that. There was no man that could do it. We, we had issues that we could not succumb, but God did that. And, and that, that, was, uh, that, was, that's, that ended a hundred year period. That was a 50 year from the, uh, 1953 uh, new experience which William Souders prophesied that after he died in November of 52 he was prophesying that God was going to do something great for the body to help them to move on after his demise and it did happen on the campground uh, in 1953 and we know it as the new experience that that took place on the campground. You remember all those people fell out all over the campground between services. It wasn't a service that did it. Just the spirit of God moved on them. Uh, the bread man drove his truck up there and left out from there and went down to Shepherdsville and said, my Lord, there's dead people in all over that hill up there on that campground. And people was laying there and, and uh, Sister Mills, I believe it was that gave out a message in tongues laying in the dirt and brother Molinaw was laying nearby and she gave out a message and he interpreted and he said this is just a drop in the bucket of what I have for my people that will help them in the days to come and so God gave something great there churches pastors and their churches went back home and the, that new experience began to fall out all over the body they used to have, they was having the experiences in different assemblies that people was getting that experience that was, that was, that took place up there on the hill. That was carried, that carried the body a long ways. And for many years, there's not too many people living that still remember it, but they'll tell you, you know, if they were there, they have a great uh, testimony of what took place of the, that new experience. Well, that was 50 years after the Holy Ghost was established in the United States. It started out in 1901 in Topeka, Kansas, in Charlie Parham's uh, school. And, uh, but they went from there with Brother Seymour in Houston, Texas, and then he went from there to Azusa Street. And by, by 1903, the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the Pentecostal movement was established in America. 50 years later, a jubilee of 50 years later, the new experience fell. Now, do you think this was a coincidence? In November of the exactly 50 years of the same month, Ray Leniger died. I say he was one of the greater prophets of our dispensation, uh, of, of this body. He was prophesying. He knew that another 50 years from 53 was the next year rolling around. And he was prophesying in, 19, in 2002 that we should have a jubilee next year. God should do something great for this body. He thought it was going to be a great move of the spirits, possibly like the new experience. What it was, was God began to heal. God began to heal this body and bring the remnants and the divisions together. And that made a hundred year uh, time frame, two jubilees. Now, when you look at the Bible, as far as what a jubilee is, a jubilee uh, is when all debts were forgiven. All Israelites were forgiven of debts. All slaves, Israelite slaves, were freed from slavery once every 50 years in the Jubilee. And all inheritance was restored to every Israelite that had an inheritance 
their, if they sold their land, it could only be sold for 50 years. If they leased it, whatever, they got their inheritance back. Look, when God healed this body and all the divisions came together, all slaves, and that is people, those, those are those who, who of us were slaves to the divisions that took place. Whatever I came in, on what side I came in, I was a slave to that. I believed it. I worked in it. That was I was servant to that. But when God healed this body, I opened my arms. I was given liberty to love my brethren uh, that had that had this message uh, of the body of Jesus Christ. And God began to give us liberty. He forgave us for all of all of our debts, all wrongdoings, everything that was owed. God forgave that. It was swept away. Uh, God, we all repented of it. God forgave us of it. And our inheritance of the body of Christ was restored and complete. God did that in a hundred year period of time. So let me go back with you here. I'm already revealed a little bit, but I'll just go back with you because I want you to know something about where we're at. So in the, 19, in, in the ninth chapter of the book of Revelations, and in the 13th verse, it says, and the sixth angel sounded. By the way, somebody remind me if I don't continue this, I want to show you why the seven trumpets were not down, are not down through the millennium. That will not fit. And I'll show you why. You can't do that. Uh, but we're in the sixth trumpet now, but I'll explain that here in a minute. The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. Now, if you read the rest of that, it's talking about, this is talking about the Reformation period. That's what the sixth, the sixth trumpet is about. Uh, it's about the Reformation. And, uh, but here are these four angels, those are ministers. That's a ministry that was bound in River Euphrates. That's Babylon. And God loosed them. He loosed them for uh, these four time frames. Okay, the first time frame, I'll, I'll tell you, was, uh, it was a year. And a year in a Jewish calendar is 360 days. And, three, and a day for a year is prophetical, and that represented 360 years. Now, I'll show you where, I, where I'm going to start that date and why I do it. And I understand this is my position, but someone in this body has to be working on time frames so we know where we're at in God's time frame. And this is my position. I'm still asking God about it. If he wants to adjust it, my mind's open to adjust it. If other brethren get something that I can see is, is a better adjustment, I would certainly uh, hope that I could accept that. But this is the best that I know of right now. And of course, I think it's. I think I'm right. You know, Brother Watson said one time in a meeting. He said, "Would every false prophet in here stand up?" <laughs> of course, nobody stood up. And he said, "Well, everybody does think they're right in their own eyes, don't they?" So you know, all of those things we have to consider. Anyway, uh, uh, Martin Luther. Uh, he wasn't the first reformer. There were men before him like Huss, Wycliffe, Tyndale. There were men, and uh, some of them were killed and martyred uh, for uh, making stands on, the, on the, the way they were seeing the word of God. They, they, God was giving them words of reformation for the church. But Martin Luther was the first one that God was able to stand with, and he had enough power even though he did have out a warrant, the Catholic Church had a warrant out to kill him uh, because they considered him a heretic. But it, I believe it was in 1517 when he nailed his 95 theses 
of wrong doings that the Catholic Church had wrong that was, he nailed it on the, thesis, on the Cathedral of Wittenberg's door. And uh, that did not establish the Reformation totally. In fact, there were several people that worked against, uh, and worked against Catholicism, you know, and, and Martin Luther, honestly, he didn't want to leave the Catholic Church. He just wanted to help. He wanted them to see what God was showing him and that they'd make some necessary changes. But of course, they didn't see it that way and they didn't want to make any changes. And so they, they considered him a heretic. Anyway, uh, but there were men that did that. The, the, they weren't fearful of those men that much. Uh, they just waited and were patient and found a time that they could put their thumb on them or destroy uh, them in, in whatever measure that was possible. But by the time, in, by 1539, King Henry VIII declared himself the head of the Church of England and pulled out of the Catholic Church. And when he did that, it brought, uh, it was far more devastating and it's far more serious when all of England was being pulled out. And uh, they bore with it for a while, but by 1943, the Catholic Church started the Anti-Reformation Movement with the Jesuit priesthood. And that's when I say it, the Reformation was established. It was well established and they realized we got to do something about this. And so at 360 years, this, this angel that was loosed for a year, 360 years, add that to uh, 1543 and you'll come up with 1903. That was the Protestant movement for 360 years that took us to 1903. Now, as I said before, the Holy Ghost was poured out in Topeka, Kansas in 1901. It, it uh, went from there to Houston, Texas, and then it went from Houston, Texas, where the Seymour went to, to Los Angeles, California, and started the mission there at Azusa Street. And of course, people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost by the droves out of that Azusa Street mission, and it, they began to move out of, they, they went there to get it. They moved across America. The Pentecostal movement uh, began to be established in 1903. By 1903, the Pentecostal movement was in swing. And so then I told you about the 250-year jubilees from 1903 until 53 the new experience and then till 2003 when God healed the body that's a hundred years and that's the day that's the day we don't there's there is different times of a day in the New Testament and so you can't just use one but it the reason I'm using that a day is because there is a hundred years from 1903 to 2003 and it's a significant a hundred year period. And so from 2003, that's when I say, after Brother Leninger died in November 2002, the next year is when God that began to heal this body. And this body, uh, I'm saying that started the 30 year period, the month of the angel of Euphrates was loosed. And we will be in the end of that 30 year period in 2033, 2003, 30 years is 2033. By the way, a 2000 year world of the Gentile world from AD 33 uh, on the day of Pentecost is 2033. It works out that way, but that's not exactly how I come up with it. I come up with it the way I'm telling you. And so I'm saying by 2033, we should be through the 30 year period and the last prophetical hour should start. And so uh, that, that is gonna take place. There, there was two woes in the Bible. 
If you go back to the book of Revelations, and I'll try to wind this up. Uh, I really just wanted to give these times, but uh, I gave some of this message out to the Dominican Republic on our Zoom meeting Monday night, and God touched me in such a way that I couldn't sleep all night. My mind was just flooded after we got through with that session, with that meeting. And I got so anointed in that meeting that I just couldn't rest. I couldn't, my mind was so awesome all night long. I just wrestled with all of that. Uh, and I feel God is trying to wake me. You know, I, saints, I believe this. I think it is a serious time. And I think you better shake yourselves. You better wake yourself up. You better be a child of the day and you better realize this pandemic is not just another t pandemic in the world and we're just thinking, well, this is all natural, just something happened. I'm telling you, the world will never be the same and the church will never be the same. And we need to, we need to uh, shake ourselves. We need, to, like the apostle Paul said, awake at, while it is, uh, while it's day, Jesus said, work, uh, uh, while it's day for there cometh a night when no man can work. Uh, he, he said himself, he said concerning the harvest of that world back there, he told his disciples, he said, say not it's four months till the harvest for the fields are white and ready to harvest. Well, it, ha it, it was four months before harvest before the barley and the wheat harvest. You know what it looks like? You know, our, our harvest of wheat is generally around May. Do you know what it looks like? May, April, March, February. You know what, it, you know what it, a wheat field looks like in February? Greater than a gourd. Barley, the same way. <laughs> Those disciples had to look at each other and say, how in the world does he think these fields are white? Well, what he was talking about was spiritually he saw that there was a harvest just right upon them. It was just upon them that there was a harvest. And, and I'm telling you the same thing is coming here. There is a harvest. We are nearing the harvest of the end of the Gentile world. And there's going to be a lot of people shook out. They can't shake themselves enough to get get right with God and get serious and sensitive enough to God. I'm telling you, God will help you. If you begin to seek God and you begin to petition God, I don't care what's wrong with you, God will lift you up out of it and he'll give you enough sensitivity that you can be a child of the day and not of the night in this last Gentile harvest in the end of this world. And so uh, these two, I'm, I'm giving you these, there's, there's two. I'll, I'm going to tell you as quickly as I can. You may not be able to maintain it, but this will go up, post it, and you can go back and listen to it over if you really want to study it. I'm going to just quickly give you these, these trumpets. In the eighth chapter of the book of Revelations, man, I don't have time to go through all that, but I'll just tell you quickly, the first angel uh, sounded and a third part of the trees were burnt and all grass was burnt. And Jesus is the one that blew that trumpet. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to try to tell you right quick a third part, what a third part is. There's only three times in the world itself that God has sets up eternal judgment. Never was there eternal judgment set up until Jesus' the judgment seat of Christ was set up in the end of the Jewish world. When God harvested that world, judgment, Paul, Peter said, judgment must first begin at the house of God. How could they judge that world if they weren't, weren't willing first to be judged themselves? They wouldn't be worthy to judge anything. And so uh, God uh, he judged that world back there with eternal judgment. That's one of the four major doctrines. And then there hadn't been any eternal judgment since the church fell away until the restored church down here 
eternal judgment in the latter, last harvest, in the end of this world, in the last prophetical hour, will take place. The, the first, the judgment in the Jewish world was a third. A third of all the people of God were judged back there. Another third of them is going to be judged down here, and the other third will be down through the thousand years, including the resurrection of the unjust <clears throat> in the great white throne judgment, that, judge, that judgment seat. So those are thirds. So right here where it said a third of the trees were burned up. God judged everybody back there. Trees are righteous people. We should be called trees of righteousness, Isaiah said. So God judged that world back there. But then it says he judged all flesh. Yes, he judged the flesh in his own life and showed that the flesh you cannot, no flesh or blood cannot enter heaven. God judged the flesh. And that's what grass represents flesh <clears throat> in the Bible. And so Jesus showed that the flesh was judged. And then <clears throat> the second angel blew, <clears throat> as there were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And a third part of the sea became blood. So here's another third part. Those were the apostles that blew that trumpet. Remember Jesus told the apostles, if you've got faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can say unto this mountain, be thou plucked up and cast into the sea. He was talking about the mountain of religion back there, which was primarily Judaism. Uh, and, he, and they did that. Those apostles, after the new covenant was set up, they absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, proved that Judaism was a fallen in a fallen condition and would not make the change to the new covenant that Jesus brought about. And they plucked that mountain up and cast it into the sea. It had no more influence over the body of Christ back there than anything ungodly in the sea had influence over. That didn't influence that. They were no longer influenced at all by the, uh, the Jewish religion. They knew better than that. They knew that Jesus Christ, the, 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 the new covenant of grace, they knew that that was the answer. And then the third angel sounded and there fell a great uh, star from heaven. And if you read through it, it'll tell you that there was, and by the way, the third part of the sea became blood. That, that's the world. Those people were cast back into the world and they were judged. And then a third part of the ships uh, were destroyed. That Those were groups. Those were secular groups, Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, Cretans, Essenes. Those, those were these different secular groups. Those were different ships that were riding on top of the sea because they had, it was a religious element that uh, was, had an influence and was, was on, uh, had found a way to be on top of the sea and not in the world uh, of the ungodly. The third angel sounded, okay, that was a, a, a star. This is when the church fell away and a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. It, it's called wormwood because it was bitter and it made the water bitter. In other words, when men in the body of Christ began to fall away, like Paul said to the Ephesians, he said, uh, after my departure, grievous wolves will enter in, spoiling the flock. Uh, he was showing that those, uh, those people, men of your own selves, will rise up making disciples of themselves. That's happening right now. It's happened in the body of Christ quite a bit. There's men that, that thinks that they can work iniquity and work against the established churches and think they can go out against established churches and try to start a work on their own without any sanction of the body. They'll find somebody, they'll say, this person sanctioned me when they're not telling the truth at all. That's happening right now in an area I know about that they ain't nobody sanctioned them. The man they're saying sanctioned them said, I did not sanction them. Told me that personally. Uh, that happens in this world. Anyway, so this is wormwood. It puts bitterness in the water. It causes people to lose their souls and lose their lives. And many people, many men died of the waters because of wormwood. That's a falling away of the church. People get shook out. 
They don't have enough of God in them to know how to work in order or what is in order. And they wind up outside of the body of Christ, acting like they're, they're a part of it just because they can, they can use some of the, the messages that we have or some of the teachings that we have, but they, they lost the order that we have. They've lost the leadership that we have. Uh, so that was the falling way of the church. Then the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten, third part of the moon, third part of the stars. And this is, this is Israel being judged in AD 70. That's what took place there. Then he said in the 13th verse, woe, woe, woe unto the inhabitants earth by reason of the voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. And of course, the fifth angel, the fifth angel, uh, it, it takes a lot more time to describe it, but it's talking about Mohammedism or Muslim religion coming against Catholicism. That was the first woe. And that slowed down the Catholic Church enough to allow the Reformation to start. They got, their, they got distracted and was fighting against the Muslim religion. Of course, God's going to use that in a great way before this world is over with. And of course, after the, it explains the fifth angel, it says that one woe is passed. And behold, the other two woes, uh, uh, the other two woes will come more hereafter. And so <clears throat> then in the sixth, sixth chapter, this, this is what I'm showing you in the sixth trumpet is the reformation actually takes place. The 10th chapter is the, the seven thunders that's going to take place. And they're not going to take place till the seventh trumpet. It, it, John was going to write it down. The angel said, no, don't write that down. He said, that's not until the seven trumpets are blown. And so uh, we won't, it, it's going to be judgment. Thunders is a sound out of heaven and a loud and a mighty sound. And so there will be a mighty sound for sure down through the last prophetical hour. Then in the 11th chapter, he starts off telling about the, how the church fell away and how it's going to be restored. Uh, I said in the 11th chapter, it says, or 11th verse of, of Revelation 11, said, after three days and a half, the spirit of the Lord, spirit of life from God entered into these two witnesses that lay dead in the streets for 1,260 years, and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them that saw them. I said, there's a, there is a long time between the, this 11th verse and the 12th verse because the 11th verse is when the Reformation started, which was 360 years plus 100 years and plus 30 years. That in the 12th verse, it said, they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. That's a restored church. And their enemies beheld them. And then look, in the same hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth part of the city fell and in the earthquake were slain of men, 7,000, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to God in heaven. The second woe is past and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. So, this, this, um, the third woe or the second woe that was passed right there is the United States going down in judgment. That's my position on that, and I think I'm right on it. Uh, I don't, I don't see any way of getting around how any ten kings can come into power. A dragon power in America still being the most powerful nation in the world. Something's got to happen to America. Uh, then now. Here, the seventh angel, in the 15th verse says, the seventh angel sounded and there was great voices in heaven saying that the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ and he'll reign forever and ever. That, that is a ministry of the restored church. And the, that's the seventh angel blows right there. Now I'm gonna show you why this can't be seven trumpets down through the, the thousand years because you go on and read their message. There, there's three messages that takes place here. Uh, uh, that uh, It's in the 14th chapter, but we'll still be in the set. We're still gonna be in the, the, see the seventh trumpet blows until the end of this book. 
I told somebody, I said, that's how important the seventh trumpet is. We're still in the seventh seal that opens in the eighth chapter. The seventh seal, the eight, the seventh seal is opened up and it opens up the whole, all the details of the book of Revelation where the first six seals were just indexes of the book. Just give short indexes or summaries of what the book was about. The eighth chapter, which starts the seventh seal, that opens up all the details of the whole book. And the seven trumpets are in the seventh seal. And the, se the seventh trumpet here uh, blows, starts blowing in the 11th chapter through the 22nd chapter. That's how important the last prophetical hour of 15 years is that it entails half of the book of Revelation. That's how important it is. All of what happens in the last prophetical hour. And here's, here's what happens. Uh, all the kingdoms, uh, the, the world's gonna get shook. Look in the 18th verse, and the nations were angry and thy wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them that destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened. Somebody asked me one time, when was it ever closed? Well, the very fact that it has to be open shows it was closed. It was closed in the beginning of this chapter of 11 when the church completely fell away. There was no way to get in second heaven or third heaven after that until it had to be restored. And all we had was the outer court and the Gentiles trod it underfoot for 1260 years. Now in the 12th chapter, he goes back to the day of Pentecost and shows how the church fell away back there, how there was a war between the body of Christ and the beast power back then and what took place into that. And then the 13th chapter shows on into the Gentile world of how finally the papacy was set up in AD 325 and established by 538, ruled for 1260 years. Then in the 14th chapter here, uh, in the 14th chapter, you'll see in the sixth verse, it said, I saw Another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice. Here they had three messages. Fear God and give him glory. Then in the eighth verse it says, and, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. We know that's in the end of the Gentile world. Here the seventh trumpet is still blowing it, you can't show me where it quit blowing or another something trumpet happened. It's continuing to blow. And here, the, this restored ministry, the whole 14th chapter is about, a, about the harvest of the Gentile world and it's in the blowing of the seventh trumpet. There's no way you can put that. Look, let me read on. In the ninth verse, said the third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast, and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same will drink of the wrath of the wine of the wrath of God. See, that was the three messages. Fear God, give him glory, Babylon's fallen. And if you worship the beast or, or his image and receive his mark, the wrath of God's gonna be poured out on you. Then in the 14th verse, it shows, John looked and saw, behold, a white cloud and upon the cloud one like the son of man having in his hand a golden crown on his head a golden crown in his hand a sharp sickle and a voice came out from the temple and said thrust in your sickle and reap for the earth is ready to reap that's the harvest of the end of the Gentile world in the seventh trumpet you cannot put that trumpet in the seven in the millennial there's the, the book of Revelation has very little to say about the millennium it, it doesn't have that much to say about it. We've got some, some uh, glimpses into the millennial reign. Very little, very little. This book was written to the Gentiles. It was written to the seven churches uh, of Asia. And uh, those were actual churches 
but it was, they got, they didn't just get their letter. They got all seven letters and the whole book and it cast the future out and showed what, what God was going to do in the entire Gentile world. And this thing, you know, is, and we're down in the end of it. I'm telling you, we're in, we're beyond, and we're just a little over 12 years until the 30 years is up and we're entering into the last prophetical hour. You know what all has got to take place in 12 years? The church has got to be restored. The two-horned beast has got to speak as a dragon. The mark of the image has got to be set up. The eight head has got to come into power. The two-horned beast is going to fall. The great earthquake. Ten kings are going to come into power. The harvest has got to take place and harvest this world gathering all of God's people out of Babylon. Then Babylon has to be judged. Then the Jews gets grafted back in to carry this torch down through the thousand years with help of the bride and of Christ, helping Jesus rule with a rod of iron during those thousand years. That bride has to be made up before. And then the seven seals gets poured out, ending in the battle of Armageddon. I don't have time to talk on them tonight. Saints of God, this is a big message. Saints of God, there's a lot that has to happen. There, you need to know as the people of God what is coming in the future, where we're at in God's timetable. And it's important. It's important. If I don't get off of here, I'm not going to be able to sleep again tonight because God's got me fired up about this and I feel like the body of Christ needs to be reminded of where we are in God's timetable and what has to take place before this world comes to its end. You and I are a part of it. You and I are to be wise virgins. We're to get oil in our lamps and we're not to sleep and slumber like many are not, were, are not serious enough to get enough oil in their lamps that they'll be able to go out and meet him when he, when he comes to make up his bride. That's sad. Pray for me. I'm, I'm praying. I'm asking God, give me the strength. Help me not to be wooed to sleep by all of these things that are taking place. So you can get in a place where you just think everything's just happening natural. It's just, just going to go on and on for years and years and things going to be as it always was. No, I'm telling you, it won't. I'm telling you, it won't. Do you think that the Ites thought that when the Jews... When Israel crossed Jordan and went in and took the land of the Ites, that changed their world. Do you think that, that everything just went on to normal when Jesus came to this world and the body of Christ came into existence and Israel was judged by A.D. 70 and the Jewish world was put out and God turned to the Gentiles? And do you think we're going to be around forever and ever as Gentiles, as the, America, as the United States of America, the greatest nation that God has ever blessed since the beginning of the Gentile world and blessed this nation with every kind of revival and every kind of thing that he could bless it with to restore his church. No, I'm telling you, this will come to an end and God is getting us near to the end. I don't mean to preach too much of an alarming message, but I think an alarm needs to be sounded. Isn't that what Joel said? Isn't that what Joel said? Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. For the day of the Lord is at hand. Huh? And Joel was talking about the day of Pentecost, but we have got an, in a restored church an exact parallel of time that we need an alarm sounded in God's holy mountain, the body of Jesus Christ. God bless your hearts. I love every one of you. Good seeing you on with us, Brother Cyprian. He, he don't understand everything in English, but he said God helps him understand what I'm saying in English. <laughs> well, he's learning English good, too. I love those brothers in the Dominican Republic. God's blessed them in a great way. Get ready. Get ready to receive more of God in your life and do more for him and see great things to happen in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless your hearts. I love you all. Those of you that are in Little Rock, I'll see you Sunday morning in church. I don't know if we're having a work day Saturday, but we are, I believe. 
some of the brethren are going to still try to come together and, and continue. We're, we're working on getting our dining room ready for new tile. Brother Nathan Painter is going to be putting up. By the way, Little Rock, we got our new projectors in. Brother Painter is going to try to get at least one of them up Saturday. So I don't know if he'll get them both up, but if he does, praise God. I'm looking forward to that. We've needed them for some time yet. Anyway, we love you. God bless you. Have a good night.